Thank you, Dave, for your faithfulness. Appreciate that. Well, this morning we are going back to the book of Joshua. We're going to look at another lesson from the general. But before we dig into scripture, there is a scene from the Lord of the Rings movie. Now, Roger, you tell Brooke that she missed this. Okay? She is a big Lord of the Rings fan, and the first time that I'm going to show a clip from the Lord of the Rings, she's not here. Ha <laughs> ha! So, uh, I have a clip I want to show you this morning because it does pertain to our discussion. Carrie? of J.R.R. Tolkien, who are about half as tall as a man, are on their way to the city of the elves. They're leaving their home country. But you see, hobbits don't like adventure. In fact, in their country, adventure is almost a swear word. So when these two are facing a giant challenge, and there in the field is where that moment of decision takes place. Each of us have moments like that, or you're going to have them. Remember the day that you went from elementary school to either intermediate or middle school, depending on where you live in the world? Remember stepping out the door on that first day of high school or, or stepping onto the campus of college for the first time? Do you remember asking that special person out on that first date or, or when you proposed? Do you remember with that realization when that first baby's cry happened that your life was never going to be the same? Remember when you moved out of your parents' home or, or the first time that you bought your own home? Remember the day that you bought your first car? All of these and more are the adventures that lie ahead of some of us, but each of us go through a myriad of firsts in our lifetime. And we can't afford to stop when we get to new territory. I remember moving from my home to the first home I had away from my parents. Scary and exciting all at once. I love to joke about the fact that uh, my parents planned to have my brother and I out of, our, uh, out of home. You see, when I turned 18, they moved to Vancouver and they left me in Calgary. And then when my brother turned 19, they moved to Calgary and left him in Vancouver. I think this was their way of saying, out you go. Now, don't get me wrong. My parents gave me the option, but I was in the middle of university at the time and it did not make sense for me to transfer. I remember my first day as pastor in, in the little town of Huendon. I moved my wife from, a, from Edmonton, which is a city of a million people, to the town of Huendon, which is 300. Culture shock. But I can remember the very first day that I came to the, the door of the church, which was right across the street from the high school, and I was unlocking the door, and a teacher came running across the street to ask me why I was skipping class. It's the only time in my life that I was ever carded to go to church. There are new experiences lying just over the horizon for each of us, but we'll never experience them if we don't move beyond the same old. Let me explain. In the book of Joshua, the Israelites are camped on the east side of the Jordan River near the town of Shittim. They've been here before. Forty years ago, their parents and grandparents stood here in Shittim. It was here that the prophet Balaam counseled the Moabite people to send in loose women to try and tempt the people of Israel. It was here that Israel sinned by sleeping with these same women. I want you to imagine for a moment, they longed to cross the same river. 
They longed for the same land across the same river, but they wound up turning around and wandering for another four decades because of their sinful choices. And here they are again, put into the very same place to make the very same choice by the very same God. Tell me, how many of you have ever noticed cycles in your own lives? I have. How many of you realize that God is willing to let you go around and around in circles until you learn the lessons that he puts in front of you? It's true because you see, God is more concerned about your character growth than about your comfort. And he's way more interested in your eternal good than he is in your temporary ease. And God allowed the Israelites to go in circles in the desert until they were willing to trust him. So here they are 40 years later and God brings them back to the same place. Does he ever do something like that in the New Testament? You bet he does. You bet he does. You read about it in, in the Gospels where, where Peter is in the courtyard where he's uh, going to deny Christ. And scripture points out in the book of John, it says that he was standing around a charcoal fire when he denied the Lord not once, not twice, but all three times. Then later after the resurrection, the f- disciples are out fishing and Jesus appears to them. He's on the shore and Peter comes running back or swimming back to the shore, not running this time. And it says that Jesus had made a charcoal fire. God will bring us back around to where we made a wrong choice. He'll bring us around again, and he'll bring us around again until we learn the lesson that he puts in front of us. And here they are. 40 years later, they're in the same place, and he places the same decision in front of them. Will you trust me? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning, if we do a real good hard look in our own lives, we'll see cycles as well. We'll see cycles, Father, of, of doing so well and then stumbling and falling. We'll see circles of addiction and freedom. We'll see circles of trusting and then sinning. We'll see circles, God, again and again in our marriages, in our relationships, in our families, in our workplaces. But God, we don't want to run in circles. We want to fix our eyes on Jesus and run the race that's laid out. So this morning, help us to learn how to leave the same old behind and to embrace what's next. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at chapters 3 and 4 of Joshua this morning. Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole chap- both chapters, but we are going to be looking there. I'm going to tell you a couple more lessons from the general, and the lessons this morning are moving beyond the same old. So the first lesson that you need to learn is this one. If you want to move beyond the same old, you must expect something great. I want you to look at the first few, cha- first, uh, first few verses of chapter 3. And there it says this, and right in the first verse, it says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. Why did they have to move? I want you to take a look at this picture of this map right here. Shittim was only about six miles from the Jordan River. They've got almost a million people. Why do they have to move six miles? Why not just stay there until they're ready to cross the Jordan? Well, when Joshua told them to get ready, it was he relocated them closer to the Jordan River in preparation because, you see, after Joshua gives the order in chapter 2 to get ready to move, he actually moves them. He's not going to risk these guys deciding, hey, you know what, the desert was kind of cool, let's go back there for another 40 years. He's going to move them towards what they're aiming for. He packs them up, he leaves nothing behind, and he moves the entire host a mere six miles to the very shore of the river. Can you imagine the nerves during that walk? Can you imagine the anticipation building over the idea that they were actually going to the promised land? Woohoo, we're actually going to Disneyland! Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the excitement when that river actually came into view? 
This generation has only ever known manna, miracles, and wandering. And now they're going into the land that they've only heard stories of. But this general is wise. He's learned how these people work and how to lead them by watching Moses for all these years. And so after having them camp by the river, Joshua knows that their nerves are on high alert. He knows that this is a crucial time. It's a make it or break it time. If he waits much longer, the people are going to get comfortable where they are. If he jumps the gun, he's going to disobey God. So he sends the leaders through the camp to give instructions in verse 3. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your position and follow it. Why? Why is it so important to follow the Ark? Well, in the very next verse, we are given the answer. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. How many of you know that going into uncharted territory is scary? How many of you like change? I do. I, I, honestly, I love change. It drives my wife crazy. <laughs> it's true. I, I like change. She does not like change. Um, but God likes change. Yeah, exactly. A little bit of uncomfortable chuckling, but that's okay. Just like Sam the Hobbit, the people of Israel were about to get to that point. Up to now, they've been this way before. This was old hat. But after they crossed that river, it's all new. It's all foreign. And there's no going back. Nerves are once again on high alert. The excitement level in the camp has just gone into orbit. And it's with this heightened level of excitement that Joshua makes this statement in verse 5. He says, consecrate yourselves. Get ready. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. There it is. There it is. God calls you. When God calls you into the new, you have to expect something great. Why? Because that is who God is. He is great, and what he does is great. And when you set your expectations high, God is invited into them. When we set our expectations low, he lets us do it in our own strength. Listen to what D.L. Moody said so long ago. He said this, God doesn't expect the impossible from us. He wants us to expect the impossible from him. If you are expecting the regular, you won't see God move. If you are expecting the ordinary, you will miss God's movement. If you are listening for the everyday, you will miss his voice. A French a Christian named Simona Weil said this, It is only the impossible that is possible for God. He has given over the possible to the mechanics of matter and the autonomy of his creatures. Say what? What she's saying is this, Don't expect God to do the ordinary. He put laws in place and he gave us brains and strength and creativity to do the ordinary. God specializes in the extraordinary, the supernatural, the impossible, because it's outside of our realm of ability. It was God who called a man to build an ark in preparation for a flood. How many of you have ever heard Bill Cosby's uh, Noah? Yeah. Noah. Who is that? It's God. Right. No, it's God. <laughs> right. No, I want you to build an ark. What's an ark? A big boat. <laughs> right. Because it's going to rain. What's rain? Water falling from the sky. <laughs> right. Okay. God does the supernatural. It was God who asked a shepherd boy to become a deliverer. It was God who asked a teenager to defeat a giant. It's God who called teenage fishermen to become world changers. And God is the one who calls screw-ups and delinquents and addicts and convicts and reprobates, and he turns them into men and women who stand for him in a dark world. He is great. He still does 
great things. And when God is calling you to move beyond the same old, you have to expect something great. Second lesson is this. If you want to move beyond the same old, you must not give in to fear. When Israel first saw the Jordan from a distance, they must have been excited. This was the barrier that they were about to cross, and on the other side was everything that they had heard stories of for more than 40 years. But when they got closer, and they heard the roar of the flooded river, and they saw the raging torrent, I'm sure there was a moment or two where there were some very wide eyes, there were some heart-beating hearts, and more than just a little bit of trembling. How are you doing today? Just fine. How many of you have ever been to Israel? How many of you have ever seen the Jordan River? How about at flood stage? Watch this. Six hundred thousand people crossing that, plus oxen and sheep and goats. Piece of cake. I mean, honestly, what would it take? A couple of hours, a lot of dead people, a bridge, a ferry, a helicopter, or a swarm thereof. And then Joshua has them camp beside it. And this roaring torrent is in their ears for at least a day. They must have had numerous bouts of, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> there were bound to be a few people who just stood there shaking their heads. Probably a few more sizing it up. You know the type, strategizing, walking over to the river's edge. Nope. Just nope. Which way is Egypt? They didn't, it, it doesn't look like a nice little wading pool. It would require a bridge or a ferry or an alternate route. And that's in our day. But for them, this was the river, this was the crossing, and this was not optional. And with all of Israel staring at this flooded river, the Lord says this to Joshua in verse 7, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. This is why they were here. God had a plan to work the impossible so the people would know everything is possible with God. They needed this here to follow Joshua there. They needed to be convinced that Moses' replacement was not a lesser leader. And so what does God say? He says this in verse 8, Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. <laughs> you saw that river. Put yourself in the sandals of those priests. What is running through their mind at that moment? He's trying to kill me. Yep. I should never have teased him about his hairdo back in grade two. Okay. I'm, why does God do this? Well, there are three reasons that I came up with. First, God was showing his majesty in the sight of Israel. And he was showing them his majesty in sight of their fear. This was Joshua's equivalent of the plagues of Egypt. This river was bigger than them, just like Egypt was, but God was going to make this river bow. The second reason is this. The ark was the most prized possession in Israel. It was where God sat. So putting the ark into the river was God's way of saying, follow me. And the third reason was is this, next to Joshua, the priests were the most influential people in camp. Having them go and lead the way into the river was showing the people that the leadership was united in this direction. No fear. And to add wonder to that situation, Joshua announces to the people what's just about to happen. In verse 13, he says this, And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. You want to know if this is a true miracle? Because there are theologians out there that are like, oh no, it was you know, just a trickle of water at the time. Look at the timing. 
Look at the river. Look at the precision. God did exactly what he said he was going to do in exactly the way he said he was going to do it at exactly the time that he said he would do it. The water stopped. The water remained in place till everything and everyone was done in the river, and then the river went back to normal. And if you weren't convinced before, look at verse 17. It says, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on, what? Dry ground while all of Israel passed over and, and had completed the crossing on dry ground. Dry ground in the middle of that river. And dry enough for more than 600,000 men, plus women and children and livestock to cross over. That is definitely miracle. But to step through the barrier, they first had to step past their fear. My wife loves bridges. I hate bridges. I have had an intense dislike of bridges, especially sway bridges. You know those, those rope bridges? Horrible, nasty things straight out of the pit of hell. Ever since I was a kid. I don't like driving over bridges. I don't like walking over bridges. And I really don't like it when bridges move when I am on them. But in order to get over them, I have to step past my fear. A couple of weeks back, we were down in winter. And on the way back, we went across uh, the longest bridge in South Dakota. It's a two-lane bridge with only K rails on the side. No, no big, long, high walls so you can't see the water below. And just as I'm pulling my truck and trailer onto this bridge, I see a semi coming down the road. I hate bridges, <laughs> but I'm committed. I can't exactly stop now. Partway through the bridge, I noticed that, okay, yeah, he's definitely approaching. He's coming down the hill. He's going to be on the bridge before I get off the bridge. So my foot goes a little faster on the accelerator. And I'm going really nice and quick across this bridge because I really don't like bridges. But you have to be willing to step past fear. In order to get past my fear of bridges, because I knew that it was going to become something more than it was, I had to step into some stupid things. You see, if you have a fear, it won't be content to stay where it is. It will want to grow. Fear is not just an emotion. Fear is, is a demonic entity, and it wants to feed. It wants to grow. My fear of bridges started to become a fear of heights. And that fear of height started to become a fear of anything where I could, didn't have my feet right on the ground. And so in order to overcome it, I had to overcome, I had to do some ridiculous things. Mountain climbing. Not so great when you have a fear of heights. Roofing. Without safety harnesses. Not wise at the best of time. But if you have a fear of heights, a little hard to do. Uh, putting fascia boards on three-story houses where you have to wrap your ankles underneath a truss and lean out so that you can hold the board with one hand and nail with the other. Scree skiing. If you don't know what scree skiing is, scree is the loose rock on the side of mountains. So you go running up and you jump on it and it starts to slide down the mountainside. And you're just in your shoes and you just kind of ride the scree down and it gets faster and faster. And if you want to stop, you just take a couple of steps. Really not a smart thing to do, but if you have a fear of heights and you want to conquer it, good way to do it. <laughs> you'll either conquer it or you'll die. But <laughs> I have refused to allow this fear to control me. And I've done some ridiculous things to push it down. Tell me, what fear holds you back? Failure? Rejection? Poverty? People? Public speaking? death. Listen to me this morning. You have been given an incredible promise found in 2 Timothy 1.7. It says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. If God did not give you that spirit of fear, then you don't have to tolerate it. You don't have to put up with it, and you don't have to give into it. God wants you to step into and through your fear, not run from it or let it control you. 1 John 4, 1 says this, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Test it. 
If it's from God, submit to it. If it's not, then take authority over it and get rid of it. How? Follow the advice that God gave Joshua. Be strong and very courageous. Fear will threaten to stop you, but if you want to move beyond the same old, you must not give in to fear. The final lesson that Joshua has for us today is this one. If you want to move beyond the same old, you must commemorate the occasion. I was in front of my church in Huendon getting ready for our Tuesday morning prayer meeting. When the Christian station that I was listening to interrupted the music to announce the attack on the Twin Towers. Needless to say, that prayer meeting took a whole different direction than we had planned. And in the years since 9-11, there have been many sculptures and parks and memorials set up to help us remember that day. This one here stands in London, England. This one is in Jerusalem. This one is in Italy. And this one's in New Jersey. Rather interesting, this one actually was given to the United States by Russia. But it's hardly known at all. These memorials do two things. They remind us of an important defining moment in a nation's history And they stand as a boundary marker telling us what we won't allow to happen again. In verses 1 and 3 of chapter 4, it says this. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Now, this seems like a strange command at first. I mean, those people are already carrying everything they own, and now God wants them to carry stones. And if you look at the wording of verse 5, each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. These are not pebbles that they are collecting. You know, this is not some small child going, ooh, look, a red rock. This is a kid, this is an adult picking up a flagstone and putting it on his shoulder. But in verses 6 and 7, we're given the reason. It's to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. These stones, worn smooth by the river's current, would stand out when put in a pile on the shore. They would be a sign and a reminder of an incredible event, a story starter for the next generation, and they would be a warning. This is the power of the God you serve. There are big events in our lives too. A marriage is a big event, and there's a ring that is given as a reminder to the covenant that we enter into. Take it off to play the drum back there because otherwise you get boom, boom, click. And that doesn't work so well. Deaths are a big event and we set up tombstones to remind us of those who have made an impact in our lives. Tragedies are big events and oftentimes like we just saw, we put up memorials to remember those dark moments. How many memorials can you think of in this country? How many big events or important people have we marked off or set up piles of stones to remember. George Washington's birthplace, Gettysburg, Abraham Lincoln, Pearl Harbor, World War I, World War II, Iwo Jima, Martin Luther King Jr., Korea, Vietnam, 9-11, and they're just a few. But they stand as signs to us today, and they stay as reminders to those who come after us. What stones are you setting up as reminders? What big events in your life are you commemorating? What achievement are you marking down? What faith milestone are you highlighting? It doesn't have to be massive. None of us have room to put Mount Rushmore in our house. But big events, big successes, even big failures can find a memorial in your testimony. 
that story, your faith story, is the, is the memorial that you set up before the Lord. It's the reminder and the warning that you lay out for other people. In Revelation chapter 12, 11, we're told that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is your memorial. You remind the enemy of his losses with your testimony. Take that, you dirty snake. You remind yourself of your God's powers with your testimony. And you tell others of the obstacles that he has overcome in your life with your testimony. And you strengthen yourself with your testimony too. Every time someone passed by those stones, they were reminded of God's power. They were warned of God's power and they were encouraged by God's power. And according to 1 Peter 2.5, which says this, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You are the stones that God is collecting and carrying on his shoulder to set up as a permanent memorial to the incredible work that Jesus did on the cross. You are the memorial that God points at. When the enemy comes along and says, what gives you the right? God goes, huh? take a look right there, I'll tell you how. When the enemy goes, and what makes you think? He points over at Brad and he goes, see, that's why I think. There was an old chorus that went something like this. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. You are the Lord's memorials. Look. Look at Lisa and see what the Lord has done. Look at Roy to see what the Lord has done. Look at Mike and see what the Lord has done. Look at Dominic and see what the Lord has done. That healing, it's worth remembering. That deliverance, that should be remembered. That baptism, that should be highlighted. That salvation, that should be honored. And that miracle needs to be told. If you want to move beyond the same old, you have to remember what God has done. You have to set up memorials in your life. And to do that, you have to commemorate the occasion. Because your kids may ask. Your kids may look at you one day and say, Hey, Mike, what makes you think that God is real? They may take a look at you and say, Dominic, tell me. Why should I believe that God is able to work in my life? Leah, they may look at you and say, what makes you think that God really heals? We need to commemorate occasions. The last time that the Israelites were on that shoreline, there was a very different sound in the camp. They whined, they complained, they worried, they criticized, and they doubted. The result, 40 years of wandering in the desert. Yay. <laughs> this time, there is no record of doubt. They were probably a lot of wide eyes and nervous laughs. But there was no whining. There may have been some very shaky legs going into that water. Think about it. You saw the river right there. So the water is stopped on the one side. Can you imagine walking forward kind of like, oh, hey, move it. Don't slow down and... No rubbernecking. Just get across the dang river. The same old is a trap, and so many people get caught in it. They go around and around in cycles in their lives because they refuse to learn the lesson that God's trying to teach them. And so often, the same old is the noose that the enemy uses to try to keep us going around the mountain again. In Huendon, where I first pastored, we began to see God come into the services. We saw some healings happening, answers to prayer were happening, and then when the Spirit led us to go out of the building and begin to invite other people to experience what God was doing, I had a gentleman come and say to me, Pastor, it's not our job to grow the church. That's your job. And the next Sunday, we were back to where we had been before. The Spirit of God had been grieved, and the move that God was initiating was stunted. In Stetler, it happened too. We had healings happen. I have a deacon who is still there, who is diagnosed with stage four cancer in four different locations in his body, and then we prayed, and he was miraculously healed. 
We saw people come to the Lord in salvation, and then a group started bringing legalism into the church, and the Spirit stopped moving forward. In both of these churches, we got to the Jordan, and we had to go around the mountain again. I don't want to see us do that. I want to see us cross the Jordan and enter into the next that God has for us. It won't be easy because there are battles over there that we have yet to face. There are enemies over that we have not yet had to deal with. There is challenging work in the next, fields that need to be cleared and plowed and planted, but the next is better than the same old because you have to expect something great. I'm longing to see the casinos in town close down because their clients are coming to church. I am longing to see the day where the strip clubs are closed down because the dancers are sitting in church beside the clients. I am longing to see the people crossing the street to tell the lost about Jesus rather than crossing the street to avoid them. I'm longing to see teens gathering their friends to pray at school. Church leaders from other states coming here to see what God is doing and then taking that fire home to their state. I had a visit with Drew Becker from Aberdeen. He's our presbyter about a week ago now. And Drew said, what, what is your sense in Watertown? I said, the picture that I keep getting in my head is God in, in the starting blocks, like he's about to start a race. He's just waiting for the gun to go off. And I don't want to see God get out of the starting blocks and go, not yet. I want to see that gun go off. I want to see him move forward. I want to see strongholds come down. And my God is mighty to save. We have to expect something great. And we ha cannot give in to fear. When you feel that finger of fear coming, chop it off. Fear is an enemy. And enemies are to be shown no mercy. Jacob walked into the office the other day with a karate kid shirt. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. And I said, you forgot the word sir at the bottom because that was the quote in the movie. But when the enemy tries to strike, you strike first. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. I won't be afraid. Tell him to go back where he belongs. If you fear the dark, conquer it. If you fear germs, conquer it. If you fear bridges, <laughs> Defeat it! If we live in fear, we will not go where God calls us. We won't do what God is asking us, and we won't accomplish what God has in store for us. Ephesians 2.10 says this, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Tell me something. Does God want works left undone? No. Does Holly, do you think God wants you to get to heaven at the end of the day and you go, well, you know, I got three of them done, Lord. <laughs> no. Lori, do you think God wants you to get to heaven and go, well, you know, I had about a 25% success rate? No. Nyla, what do you think? Does God want things left undone? No. You and I have to be strong and very courageous. We conquer our fear and we finish the tasks that God puts forward for us to do. And we have to commemorate the occasion. Stop looking at the good old days. The best days are yet to come. How do I know? Because when I asked God, why would you take me down to Watertown, South Dakota? He said, because I have better in store for you. He brought me here. That tells me that this is better. So it's not about what's back there. It's not about what used to be. It's not about 10 days ago. God has better in store. And so we have to pursue the better. We're not going to set up in memory plaques. We are going to be the living stones that God points to. And you know what? He's already doing it. Aaron and Betty Greep are memorials to God's faithfulness. Marge Greep is a memorial to God's power. Gordy is a memorial to God's protection. Pam is a testimony to God's healing. Mike is a testimony of God's omniscience. Danny is a testimony to God's miraculous power. And each one of us have testimonies that proclaim what God has done, is doing, and will still do. But for some, the barrier is actually faith. That's the Jordan. 
You don't know if this whole church thing, this whole Jesus thing is for you. It sits in front of you like an impassable barrier, and it's scary. That's why Jesus asked Peter to walk out onto the water. With Jesus, the scary, the daunting, and even the impossible, they're just stepping stones. Put your hand in his and watch the flooding river become a trickle. What is the Jordan in your life? In these two chapters, the focal point is the river. It was the barrier in front of them, a bridge to the future, and when they got into it, a memorial, because now it's behind us. And that's what God wants you to understand this morning. The thing in your life that is holding you back, that is preventing your growth, that is saying this far and no further, it's only that big because of fear. Once you let God take you into it, that obstacle becomes a bridge for God to take you further, higher, and deeper than you ever thought you would ever go. And once you get across it, then it goes from being a barrier to being a blessing. It gets added to the pile of stones that you set up in your life and you can point to and say, look what the Lord has done. The Jordan is not impassable. It just needs a touch from Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you are the one who builds bridges. You are the one who crosses barriers. There is only one impossible chasm, Father, in life. And that was the chasm between a righteous God and unrighteous people. And you bridged it with the cross. This morning, Father, I'm praying, whatever the fear is in each person's life, that we would drum up the courage and conquer it. We would not be held captive by fear. <coughs> that you would use us, O oh God, to set up memorial stones and point to them and say, this is what God has done. You would use us to expect something great. When people are, are, are complaining about their day, oh, you know, I had a horrible day, I had a miserable day. God, that you would remind them that with God, all things are possible. That God has more in store. That he really does have plans to prosper and not to harm. To give us a future and a hope. And God, we have to be willing to record and celebrate and commemorate the big things that happen. Our failure can lead to an opportunity for ministry. Our successes can lead us higher. But God, we have to be willing to mark off those times in our life, the good and the bad and even the ugly, because you have promised to work all things out for good for those who love you. So we have to be willing to commemorate what you're doing in our lives. Lord, if anyone is here this morning and they haven't given their life to Christ, I will not let a service go past without an opportunity for that to take place. Maybe you've been sitting in church and you've been afraid to take that step, that step from unbelief to faith, from being a seeker to being a child of God. If that's you this morning, today is your chance. Today is your chance to go from death to life, to go from hopeless to hopeful, to go from lost to found. So if that's you this morning, I want you to just slip your hand up so I can pray for you. Mm -hmm. See that? Lord God, you know the hearts in this room. You know the hearts and you know the hurts. You know the Jordan River in each one's life. But today, God, we're camped at the side of that Jordan. We have a decision to make. Are we going to trust you or are we going to run around the mountain again? Help us to trust you and go forward. Help us to trust you and take the land that you've put in front of us. Help us to have courage and to be strong and to face what you have in front of us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. May the God of peace still your fear. May the God of courage give you boldness. And may the God of the impossible 
Make a way where there seems to be no way. Let this be a week of fruitfulness. That may take many different forms. But let it be a week where you can honestly say at the end of it, I saw God move. Expect something great this week. And then look for God to do it. God bless you. Have a fantastic and expectant week. Amen.